Hi there. My name is Yasmin, and I am a third year medical student from the University of Alberta. This video has been created with help from Dr. Azim Valji, a thoracic surgeon at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. The topic of today's video will be chest tubes. Students, general practitioners, and specialists are all exposed to chest tubes. In this video, we will go over all aspects of chest tubes, from insertion to removal. After watching this video, you will be able to list the indications for chest tube insertion, describe the proper positioning and insertion technique for tube thoracostomy, list the complications of chest tube insertion, describe the mechanism of how a chest drainage system works, troubleshoot improperly functioning chest tubes, and finally, determine when a chest tube can be removed and describe proper removal technique. A chest tube is a catheter that is inserted through the chest wall into the pleural cavity. The pleural cavity is the potential space surrounding the lungs. This potential space is maintained by negative pressure, which is important in allowing the lung to expand during inspiration. When fluid or air accumulates in the pleural space, the ability of the lung to expand is limited. To improve lung expansion, this air or fluid must be evacuated. Chest tubes are inserted for this purpose. The common indications for chest tube placement are shown in the table. The goal is to evacuate air or fluid from the pleural space, thereby allowing the lung to re-expand. Relative contraindications for chest tube placement include uncorrected coagulopathy. In order to insert a chest tube, the patient should be positioned in a supine or semi-recumbent position. The patient's ipsilateral arm should be abducted and the elbow flexed in order to position the hand behind or above the patient's head. Alternatively, the arm can be left abducted at the side of the patient. It is often helpful to place a pillow or shoulder roll under the chest to elevate the side that is involved. The triangle of safety is a safe area to insert a chest tube. This is an area bordered anteriorly by the lateral border of the pectoralis major, posteriorly by the lateral border of the latissimus dorsi, and inferiorly by a horizontal line at the level of the fifth intercostal space. The level of the fifth intercostal space is marked by an imaginary line extending laterally from the inframammary fold. The chest tube will be inserted via an incision in the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary line within the triangle of safety. Before inserting the chest tube, a sterile table should be prepared consisting of a scalpel, local anesthetic, gauze, suture and needle, chest tube, teleclamp, and chest drainage system, such as a pleura evac. The standard method for inserting a chest tube is called the blunt dissection method. First, the patient should be positioned appropriately, followed by skin preparation with antiseptic and then draping. Next, Local anesthetic should be infiltrated into the skin at, and subcutaneous tissue at insertion site. If possible, an intercostal block should be performed. This should encompass three levels, including the site of incision and one intercostal space below and above where the tube will be placed. Then, an incision about one and a half to two centimeters in length should be made parallel to the rib, one intercostal space below the desired insertion site. A blunt clamp can then be used to bluntly dissect the subcutaneous layers and the chest wall muscle, followed by the intercostal muscle. The path of dissection should transverse diagonally up towards the superior intercostal space in order to create a short subcutaneous tunnel from the incision site to the desired intercostal space. Next, the clamp, in a closed position, 
should be pushed over the superior portion of the rib and through the intercostal muscle and parietal pleura. It is pushed over the superior portion of the rib to avoid injury to the neurovascular bundle that runs along the inferior portion of the rib. The clamp should then be opened, which will spread the intercostal muscles and the parietal pleura. A finger can then be used to palpate the pleural layer and check for the presence of adhesions, as well as ensure that the lung falls away from the pleura. Next, the chest tube will be inserted into the pleural cavity. Using the clamp, the chest tube should be inserted through the tract into the pleural space. If the chest tube is being inserted for a pneumothorax, it should be directed apically. For an effusion, it should be directed inferiorly and posteriorly. After insertion, it is important to secure the chest tube in place with a heavy suture such as a number O silk. Interrupted sutures can be placed around the incision to close it tightly around the tube. A horizontal mattress suture can be placed around the tube and left untied so that it can be used to close the incision once the chest tube is removed. After securing, the chest tube should be connected to a sterile pleural drainage system, such as a pleurevac. Lastly, a chest x-ray should be obtained to confirm placement. The Seldinger technique can be used for chest tube placement, which involves using a guide wire to place the chest tube. This technique is particularly useful for the placement of small bore chest tubes and pigtail catheters. It is performed with the aid of ultrasound to confirm placement and positioning of the wire in the pleural cavity. Commercial kits are available to place tubes using the Seldinger technique, including the Thal Quick Chest Tube Set and the Portex Seldinger Chest Drainage System. The steps involved in inserting a chest tube via the Seldinger technique will now be discussed. The patient should be positioned in the same fashion as previously discussed for the blunt dissection method. The site of insertion will be based upon ultrasound guidance. After first anesthetizing and preparing the site, the physician should insert the introducer needle into the pleural space above the rib. They should then aspirate fluid or air into the syringe. After fluid or air is aspirated, the guide wire should be inserted through the introducer needle there should be no resistance to the wire passing through. There will be a mark on the wire which indicates appropriate level of insertion when the wire is entering the hub of the introducer needle. After reaching the mark, the wire should be maintained in position and the needle can be removed. Now, a dilator can be introduced over the guide wire and advance. This is used to dilate the entry tract by performing a twisting motion. The dilator can then be removed. The chest tube or chest tube inserter should then be passed over the wire into the pleural space. Once the chest tube is advanced into the pleural space, the guide wire and the chest tube inserter can be removed. The chest tube can now be attached to the drainage system. Advantages of the Seldinger technique include a smaller incision, minimal tissue dissection, and less pain for the patient. Disadvantages include an inability to assess for the presence of adhesions between the lung and the pleural surface. Again, after insertion, a chest x-ray should be ordered to confirm placement. Chest tubes come in a variety of sizes, which range from 6 to 40 French. Sizes are based on the circumference of the tube. The diameter of the chest tube is equal to the French size divided by 3. For example, a 36 French is 12 millimeters in diameter. Small bore chest tubes are typically defined as 14 French or less, and large bore chest tubes are greater than 14 French. Chest tubes can be straight or curled at the end. Chest tubes which are curled at the end are called 
pigtail. The size of chest tubes selected depends on the type of, of intrathoracic collection being drained. Pneumothorax can be drained with small bore catheters, while draining blood or pus requires larger bore catheters. For a primary spontaneous pneumothorax, a small bore catheter should be adequate. However, if a larger air leak is anticipated, such as in a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax, then a larger chest tube may be needed. For a hemothorax, large bore chest tubes should be used as blood will easily clot in a small bore tube. The British Thoracic Society's guidelines suggest that for a malignant or infectious effusion, including empyemas, small bore chest tubes are usually adequate. However, it is important to remember that some empyemas may be very gelatinous and therefore larger tubes will be needed. There exists a lot of controversy in regards to what size of chest tube to use in varying conditions. For the most part, remember that when a small bore chest tube is used, it is more likely to become clotted and to stop draining at an earlier time, depending on the type of material that is transversing through. As with any medical procedure, the insertion of chest tube is associated with risks and complications. Many of the possible complications associated with inserting the chest tube stem from incorrect placement. This can involve placing the chest tube intraparenchymally, in a fissure or in the chest wall. Perforation or laceration of the diaphragm can occur during chest tube placement if the tube is incorrectly placed. Incorrect placement can also result in the chest tube being placed intra-abdominally which can lead to gastric, bowel, or hepatic injury. Splenic injury can also occur. The spleen's proximity to the left hemidiaphragm puts the organ at risk if a chest tube is placed below the diaphragm. Cardiac and major vascular injury is also a risk of insertion. Improper placement technique can result in the perforation of the pericordium or the aorta. The lungs and surrounding ribs and vessels are also vulnerable to damage. The position of the intercostal arteries on the inferior border of the ribs makes them vulnerable to damage during chest tube placement. This manifests in bleeding and hemothorax. Intercostal neuralgia can also result from trauma to the intercostal nerves located inferior to the ribs. Laceration to the lung parenchyma is also a risk of chest tube placement, especially if pleural adhesions are present. Once the chest tube is inserted, it must be connected to a chest drainage system. The most commonly used chest drainage system is the three-chamber plastic unit, such as a pleurivac or atrium. This system consists of three interconnected chambers, a collection chamber, a water seal chamber, and a suction control chamber. Fluid or air drains from the patient's chest into the collection chamber. The fluid or air accumulates in this chamber. The next chamber is the water seal chamber. Air enters this chamber below the water level, moving through the water seal. This prevents return of air to the patient. This chamber has a one-way valve, which allows air to exit the pleural cavity during expiration. Air cannot re-enter the pleural cavity during inspiration due to the pressure in the chamber. The last chamber is the suction chamber. The suction chamber may use a wet or dry suction mechanism. The suction chamber is attached to continuous external suction to remove air or fluid. It can also be placed on water seal where no active suction is applied. The height of water in a wet system in the suction chamber indicates the amount of suction applied. In a dry system, the amount of suction is controlled by a suction control dial. Suction pressures are typically between negative 10 and negative 40 millimeters of mercury. Typically, if suction is being used, it is set to negative 20 millimeters of mercury. However, this is a closed system 
and it is not necessary for suction to be applied for the system to work. Fluid will still drain even if suction is not applied. Digital plural drainage systems have become commercially available in recent years, such as the Topaz. These devices incorporate digital sensors for measuring plural pressure and flow through chest tubes. The electronic drainage systems are able to quantify air leaks and intrathoracic pressures. These values are measured continuously and can be used to guide clinical management of chest tubes. These digital devices are also able to provide higher amounts of suction, which may be needed in certain circumstances, such as in patients who have had severe barotrauma and have large air leaks. After the chest tube is inserted, it should be attached to the drainage system, such as a pleurivac. A chest x-ray should be immediately requested to ensure adequate position and to assess for any complications. The drainage system should be kept below waist height to ensure drainage and avoid retrograde flow. A clear dressing should be used to cover the drain site. The skin should be assessed to ensure that it is tight around the area of chest tube placement. The tube should also be assessed to make sure it is appropriately secured in place and connected to the drainage system. Patency of the system can be assessed by observing the drainage of fluid into the collection chamber. Normal movement of the water column in the drainage bottle or tubing should be observed during the respiratory cycle. This is called swimming. During inspiration, a normal negative intrathoracic pressure is generated, and as such, the drain content will be drawn back towards the patient. This is reversed during expiration, which gives rise to a characteristic swinging appearance. It is critical to observe this, as a lack of normal swinging movement indicates that there is a problem in the system, either in terms of the chest tube or the drainage apparatus. Characteristic drain behaviors are observed depending on whether air or water is being drained from the pleural cavity. If air is being drained, the drain will initially bubble spontaneously due to the increased intrathoracic pressure forcing air out of the pleural space. Initially, bubbling will occur all the time. As the air leak resolves, Bubbling will only occur during expiration. Eventually, bubbling will only occur during coughing. When the air leak resolves completely, bubbling will stop altogether and the drain will only swing. If fluid is being drained, the effusion will initially drain quickly due to the increased intrathoracic pressure caused by the effusion. The high flow rate can be observed in the initial quick filling of the drainage tube and bottle. As the intrathoracic pressure is reduced, filling will slow and swinging of the fluid in the drain will become apparent. No more than one and a half liters should be drained at one go. Initial fluid drainage can be limited by clamping the chest tube and waiting at least an hour until more fluid is drained. This is to reduce the risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema. It is important that chest tubes are monitored each day. Drain output and presence of bubbling should be monitored every one to four hours. Normal swinging movement of the drain contents during the respiratory cycle should be observed. Patients should be asked about the development of symptoms such as shortness of breath, cough, and chest pain. The drainage system should remain upright, be well secured, and remain below the level of the chest. It should be ensured that there are no kinks or bends in the tubing. The presence of an air leak should be examined every day. This is done by examining the air leak detection chamber in the water seal of the drainage system. An air leak presents as air bubbles. Intermittent or constant bubbling within the water seal chamber is indicative of an air leak, which is often more apparent when the patient coughs. The greater the amount of bubbles, the more severe the air leak. 
The drain site should be monitored daily for signs of infection or hematoma. Dressing should remain dry and intact and should be changed daily. After the chest tube is inserted, questions often arise as to how to appropriately manage the chest tube. One common issue that often arises is what to do if bubbling is seen in the air leak chamber. If bubbling is seen in the air leak chamber, this indicates that there is an air leak between the patient and the water seal. The tubing and connections of the tubing to the drainage system should be checked to ensure that there are no loose connections, as loose connections can cause air to enter the system. In addition to leaks occurring within the drain or tubing, air leaks can originate from the tube insertion site or from the chest cavity. In order to determine the location of the leak, the chest tube should be clamped as close as possible to the patient. If the air leak continues, the leak is coming distally from the clamp, either from the distal attachment site of the tube to the drain due to a loose connection or from the drainage system. If bubbling disappears when the tubing is clamped, the air leak is coming from the insertion site or from within the pleural cavity. Another common question that can arise after chest tube is insertion is how to manage a chest tube when there is no observable swinging. If no swinging is observed, then there is no movement of fluid or air out of the pleural cavity and into the drain. One reason for this could be that the chest tube is displaced, dislodged, or kinked, resulting in an inability for fluid to flow. The chest tube should be inspected to ensure that it is still in place, unkinked, and that all attachments are secure. If no swinging was observed since the time of placement, then the chest tube could be placed in the wrong position. Imaging must be ordered to assess the position of the chest tube and to determine whether repositioning is necessary. A lack of observable swinging can also signify a blockage of the chest tube. Drain blockage can be caused by fibrin clots, blood, or by having the drainage holes occluded by the chest wall. Drain blockage usually occurs in the days following chest tube placement. In the case of a drain blockage, the patient can present with shortness of breath. If drain blockage is suspected, the drain can be flushed with 10 mils of 0.9% saline. Pleural air and free-flowing fluid will generally drain from the chest tube without the need for suction. If the pleural air or liquid is not responding adequately to gravity water seal drainage, suction may be applied. The American College of Chest Physicians Spontaneous Pneumothorax Guideline suggests that attaching the chest tube to a water seal device with or without suction is acceptable in most spontaneous pneumothorax patients. If there is a large air leak coming from the patient, then suction may be required. This is often seen with increasing subcutaneous emphysema or failure of the lung to re-expand on x-ray. In this scenario, one may also need to insert more chest tubes to keep up with the air leak. Re-expansion pulmonary edema is a relatively rare complication that can occur shortly after chest tube insertion due to overly rapid drainage of pleural effusions. Re-expansion pulmonary edema is caused by the rapid expansion of lung parenchyma following fluid drainage. Clinical manifestations of re-expansion pulmonary edema include dyspnea, tachypnea, cough, and decreased oxygen saturation. Dyspnea usually manifests immediately, and dyspnea and tachypnea are rapidly progressive. Other symptoms include cyanosis, tachycardia, hypotension, nausea, and vomiting. Chest x-rays may show alveolar shadowing, and CT scan findings can include brown glass opacities, septal thickening, and atelectasis. Treatment is supportive and involves administration of supplemental oxygen 
and hemodynamic support. If needed, mechanical ventilation with positive and expiratory pressure can be applied. In order to minimize the risk of experiencing re-expansion pulmonary edema, it is best to drain one to one and a half liters of fluid and then clamp the chest tube for one hour when draining a large effusion. This procedure should be repeated to slowly evacuate the fluid and allow the lung to re-expand slowly. Subcutaneous emphysema is another complication that can develop after chest tube placement. It can occur immediately or in the days following surgery. Subcutaneous emphysema should be suspected when normal swinging is not observed in the drain and the patient presents with clinically demonstrated subcutaneous crepitation. This tends to affect the subcutaneous tissue surrounding the drain. However, it can also affect other areas of the thorax, arms, abdomen, and face. It can lead to voice changes and shutting of the eyelids. When present, it indicates that either the chest tube is blocked or that the air leak is massive and that one chest tube is not sufficient for evacuating all the air. Hence, the air tracks subcutaneously. In this situation, one must ensure that the chest tube is patent, apply suction, and in some cases, insert a second chest tube. Once the air leak is controlled, the subcutaneous emphysema will reabsorb on its own. The timing of chest tube removal depends on the indication for the chest tube. In the case of pneumothorax, the chest tube can be removed when there is no evidence of an air leak and the lung is fully expanded on a chest x-ray. There must be no visible air leak present, which would be seen as bubbling, and air must not accumulate when suction is removed. In the case of a pleural effusion, the chest tube can be removed when the lung is fully expanded and the patient's clinical status has improved and the drainage is between 100 to 450 mils of clear serous fluid in 24 hours. Once removal criteria are met, the chest tube can be removed. In preparation for removal, the skin sutures can be cut and gauze should be kept ready on hand. The chest tube can be removed at end expiration or end inspiration. The patient should be instructed to perform a forced valsalva maneuver or to inhale to total lung capacity after forced expiration. The major concern with removing a chest tube is the risk of pneumothorax from air entering into the pleural cavity through the chest tube site. However, Neither technique has demonstrated superiority in the prevention of pneumothorax. Prior to removing the tube, the technique should be explained to the patient and rehearsed several times. To remove, use the dominant hand to quickly remove the chest tube at the appropriate time and use the other hand to place a sterile dressing over the site. The dressing can then be secured with occlusive tape over top. Alternatively, a suture which was placed at the time of chest tube insertion can be tied to close the incision upon removal. In this case, a simple dressing can be applied over top as the risk of inhaling air through an open wound is not present. A chest x-ray four to six hours after removal is recommended to assess for pneumothorax or reaccumulation of fluid. That concludes this video presentation. Thank you for watching.